Welcome back as we continue with Kingdom Exploration Session 11B or Part 2 of it. Uh, session 11 being led into the Holy, by the Holy Spirit into the importance of wilderness and temptation experiences. Now I want to begin by looking at the challenging, how the enemy of our soul challenged the authenticity of Jesus. I want to begin here in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 4. It says there, Then Jesus was led up by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. Now, I think this is interesting. Many of us would have some theological problems with that. We want to expect that maybe it was a young woman who tempted him, or, or maybe it was gold, or maybe it was glory, or some special thing. But no, this says it was the Holy Spirit that led him into the wilderness in order to be tempted by the devil. That's a very challenging perspective. Jesus had just come out of the water, fulfilling all righteousness. The Holy Spirit had come down upon him, and he had heard the voice of the Father in heaven saying, This, you are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And then, on that victory, the Holy Spirit leads him into a place of temptation. And verse 2 says, And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, after that, he was hungry. He was a natural man. He had appetites. He ate like everyone else. He was not some unusual human being. He hungered. He thirsted. And it says in verse 3, Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God. If you are the Son of God. Command these stones to become bread. So he was bringing to Jesus his immediate need. He says, if you're really the son of God, take care of yourself. Take care of your need. And he wants Jesus to do something to create, to take the stone and make it in the bread. Now, Jesus never says it's impossible. He never said it was impossible. I can't do that. He never talked about that. He didn't talk about the impossibility of it. It's kind of like those stones, you know, at the end of his life when they said, tell your disciples to be quiet. And he says, if my disciples are quiet, even the stones will shout out. Amen. <laughs> yeah, it's possible that some of these stones around here could do a lot more than we give them credit for. But no, this is what Jesus says. He says it's written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now, he's not talking about the scrolls. He's not talking about the scriptures of the Old Testament. He's not talking about that. He's talking about the, uh, the word spoken to him by the Father as he comes out of the water. And it's that spoken word, that rhema word to him that he's walking in, and under for 40 days. When God speaks to you, and you hear God's voice, it will change your life, and you will be able to carry that, and under that, and in that, for, for days and days, maybe years. Challenging the authenticity of Jesus of Nazareth identity as the Son of God <coughs> is often the first and perhaps most severe of the devil's temptation. And to us as well. The devil will come to us. <clears throat> and not only will he challenge the identity of Jesus as the Son of God, he will uh, challenge your identity as a child of God, as a daughter of God, as a son of God. Who do you think you are, you might hear? In this first of three temptations, we witness that the authenticity of Jesus of Nazareth as the Son and anointed one of God, was not going to be based upon his ability to perform miracles. 
It's not based upon his ability to perform miracles to meet his own needs or the needs of others. But it's going to be based upon the prophetic spoken word of God. His authenticity was based upon both the written, it was there, everything was there, but it was administered by the spoken prophetic word coming from the mouth of God. You must understand that. It's not enough to just say, well, I have all these scriptures memorized, or this is a special scripture, and I love this, and I like that, I memorize it. No, what is God saying? What's God saying? Hear Him. Spend time with Him. Have an expectation. We have so few Christians that know how to hear the voice of God and do hear the voice of God. But God wants to speak to us. Anyway, His authenticity as the Son of God was not based upon His observance of religious ceremonial rituals. That wasn't it. It wasn't because he went to church so many times that he was the son of God. It wasn't his ability to perform miracles nor any other works of self-effort to conform to prescribed actions. He didn't jump through any hoops to be, to prove who he was. Now in this first of three trials, the devil questions his identity. But Jesus said nothing relating to his own identity, nor did he engage in any level of self-justification of his identity. You have to hear what I'm saying. When the devil comes and attacks your identity, he's trying to draw you into a measure of self-justification of who you are. And if you begin that process, there will be a handle in your soul that the devil will grab a hold of and whip on you. He will beat you. The devil, he demands that Jesus prove who he is. Show me. If you're the Son of God, show me. Do something. Come on. Stand up here. I want to see you do something. If you're an apostle, do something. If you're a prophet, do something. If you're a child of God, do something. Prove it. This temptation appears in so many ways today in our lives. And the devil often implies or demands, did God really speak to you? Do you really think that God of heaven and earth, the God who spoke the stars into being, really spoke? spoke to you, and he will come. I'm on, I'm on slide 14. And he will come and he will question, did God really speak to you? And basically, this is a repeat. It's, he's, no, he's no creator. He's a repeat of the temptation that brought the fall of mankind in Genesis 3, 1. Has God said, has God indeed said, can you be sure that your household will get saved? That you and your whole household, can you trust? What did God say to you? Well, I read it. Well, that's not enough. What did God say? How did God con confirm that? It's the same question can be heard today in so many varied ways. This is like, listen to what the devil will say. If you are really God's child, then why doesn't he take care of you? Why did your daughter die? Why are you burying your mother of cancer? The devil almost always attacks the character of God as our loving father. He invariably attacks the image of God in which we were created to fellowship with Him as His children. But God is, not in, God is not obligated to vindicate our efforts of self-justification. If we get involved in self-justification of our identities, 
even though it may be accurate, God has not obligated Himself anywhere from Genesis to Revelation to back you up in your self-justification. He says, trust me. Trust me. I will be your vindicator. I will be the one. <laughs> when, when the devil questioned, demanded, if you are the Son of God, the demand, he demanded a show of proof, a demonstration, a dance, if you would. The devil and the world will always demand observable, measurable works of proof to substantiate the claims of Jesus of Nazareth. Let me say that again. The devil and the world and religion will always demand observable, measurable works of proof to substantiate the claims of Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus gave the devil and the world proof. He did. But it was on the Father's terms. It's when the Father told him. It's when the Father said. He says, I only say those things I hear my Father saying. I only do those things I, my, I see my Father doing. He did give the proof, but not at the jump, not at the command, not at the demand of Satan or the people. Not according to their need, but according to what was the purpose and plan and design of the Father. The tempter came and seductively attacked the testimony of the Father's heart to Jesus and about Jesus to others. He's saying, when you're, are you really the Son of God? Well, listen, I just heard God say, this is my beloved Son. You know, and I heard Him say it to others, this is my beloved Son. You are my beloved Son. And yet the devil comes and he attacks the Word of the Lord. The devil will attack the Word of the Lord to you. He will challenge God's concern for you by asking, why doesn't He take care of you? Why are you hungry? If God cared, why are you sick? If God cared, why did your younger sister die? If God cared about you and about how you felt, He would have done something more than fill in the blank. He taunts you. Are you really beloved? Remember when the, when the father says, you are my beloved son? Are you really beloved? What does that mean anyway? Why would God love you? Can you really trust him? God won't do for you what he has promised. Can you really trust God to do what he promised to do? Oh, my friends. Here comes the power of performance upon the scene. The power of performance. What do I mean? The power of performance is a creature, by the way. Jesus created all things, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. The principalities and powers, the thrones, the dominions, they all have names. God named them like He named all the stars. They have character attributes. They're creatures. Now, we don't know much about them because we are so immature. But there is one called the power of performance. The power of performance, this is, you can describe it, this is a description. The power of performance demands that we produce in order to be of value. Therefore, we judge our value based upon what we are able to produce through our performance. Ah, it goes on. The Father has established the benchmark assessment of every human being's value based on the blood of His Son, Jesus of Nazareth. See, God has already established the value. You don't have to work for it. He said, you are worth the blood of my son. Shed upon a cross. Spilt and sacrificed. But not enough. Then it was carried into heaven. And it was placed upon an altar as an offering. And there it established a covenant. 
And it's on the basis of that. You don't believe me? Look at this scripture in Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 to 14. It says here, picking up in the middle of a sentence, it says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us. The Father has qualified us. What? To be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us. He has transferred us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. We're talking about kingdom transition from the kingdom of darkness, the thinking of the darkness, the law of sin and death, over to the kingdom of God, the kingdom of the Son's love, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And who did it? The Father. The Father has qualified you. And why? It says in verse 14, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. The power of performance is broken, destroyed by the blood of Jesus of Nazareth. Not only at the cross, but also on the altar in heaven. Now my friends, there is a benchmark value And we dare not compromise. We dare not cheapen the value of any human being through works and works-oriented approval and acceptance. You're not a good enough mother if you don't have children. You're not a good enough this if you don't do that. I tell you what, there's no such thing as a happy hoop hopper. You see all the you go to the you go to the circus and you see all these uh, little poodles and they're all decorated and they're going from one to another they're jumping through the hoops they're jumping through the hoops. There's no such thing as a happy hoop hopper. We were not created to be happy hoop hoppers. Under the power of performance, like a leash, we were called to walk in fellowship with God. Now let me. Turn this coin just a little bit. Because I want to show you another side. I'm on slide 16. And here we have the story of a man, John the Baptist. Several years after having baptized Jesus, several years after having heard the voice, seven years after having seen the Holy Spirit come down, he said he said to one, who sent me said that the one who the Holy Spirit came upon, he was the Messiah. See, he had given testimony of this. But now he's living, he's in jail. He's about to lose his life. And he sits there and he says to himself, now, he probably didn't really say, are you the real deal? But I'm just guessing in the vernacular, are you the real deal? Or are you just another phony pretending to be someone or something you're not? Now, in Luke 7, verses 18 to 20, this is what it says. Then the disciples of John reported to him concerning all these things. They came to him and visited him in jail. And John, calling to his disciples, sent them to Jesus, saying, Are you the coming one, or should we look for another? It's such a simple question. He's he's about ready to lose his life. He's sitting in prison. And he's got to be asking the question, were you the real one? Were you the right one? Did I really do it? When the men had come to him, they said, when they came to him being Jesus, they said to him, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, are you the coming one? Or do we, or should we look for another? Now, Is this similar to what the devil said? Remember the devil said, if you're the son of God, do this. Or is this, what is this? This this questioning. Are you the real deal? Are you the coming one? Or should I look for another? John's question was on the basis of his relational right to identity. Let me say it. John's question is on the basis of his relational 
right to identity. He had a right to inquire. John the Baptist was the one who had first confirmed the identities of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, the interesting thing is the consequences of following the purpose and plan for his life had brought the priest prophet to the uncomfortable imprisonment and eventual loss of his life. He obeyed God. He did what God told him. He was in the place of righteousness with Jesus and it brought him to being beheaded. Very uncomfortable. Sometimes we think, oh, we just if we just obey God, then everything will be rosy. I'll bet while he was in prison, he may have thought about the days when he was out and the crowds were gathering around him. He may have remembered what he said in John, as recorded in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 29. It says there, the next day, this is the next day after baptizing him. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This was the functional identity. This is what Jesus was going to do. As, priest, as a priest, it was important that John identify the functional identity and approve and accept Jesus of Nazareth as the Passover lamb of the deliverance and atoning sacrifice and offering provided by God to remove the sin of the world, providing the restoration of fellowship with the Father. See, it took a priest to approve and accept the Passover lamb. It wasn't just somebody just did it. There, had to, there was a ritual and it had to be approved by a priest. John stepped forward out of the family of Zacharias as a priest and he recognized and approved and accepted Jesus of Nazareth as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. That's why it's important. But then he would have remembered also how John recorded just a few uh, verses later, I have testified that this is the Son of God. He would have done that as a prophet. See, as a prophet, he would have understood all the signs of the day. He would have understood the scriptures that had been written and prophesied so many centuries before. He would have known those things. And he would have spoken out of that as a prophet. It was important for him to identify the relational identity of Jesus of Nazareth as the Son of God. It was His relational identity as a Son out from which His functional identity as the Lamb would proceed. We do not understand our relational identity as a result of what we do. What we do comes out of who we are. We talked about that in the last session. But I wonder if John wondered, while he's sitting in prison, have I misled the people? I told everybody this Jesus of Nazareth was the Lamb of God. I told everybody that He was the Son of God. I told him that testimony. And he would have said something like, I can just imagine him sitting there saying something like, can I trust what I thought I heard God say to me so many years ago. Aren't we all been in that place where we've heard the voice of God and we say, can I really trust? I'm not, I, I believe God, but maybe I misunderstood. Maybe I misheard. Maybe I didn't get it right. Can I trust what I thought I heard God say to me so many years ago? In Luke chapter 7, verse 21 and 23, it says this. At that very hour, He, Jesus, cured many of their infirmities or illnesses, afflictions and evil spirits. And to many blind, He gave sight. I think that's interesting. He didn't heal the blind. He gave them sight. He had sight to give away. And this is what he said. He said, I answered to those who had come to him. And he says this, You, go tell John the things 
that you have seen and heard. Seen and heard. Remember we said the gospel of the kingdom of God is a show and tell message? You go tell them what you have seen and heard. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel of the kingdom of God preached to them. And so he says, go tell John. But listen to me. Jesus did not do something in order to prove who he was. He simply pointed to the evidence, the signs, wonders, and miracles of what he had already done. See, I don't have to do something to prove who I am. Just be who you are and do it, and then let people, let God pick up the signs. I don't have to say, well, let me show you I'm this mighty man of God. I'm going to do this. No, just go do it. Will you just go do it? Go win 10,000 people. Then you can tell somebody calls you an evangelist. Then you can say amen. But you know what? You won't have to say anything. Because your fruit will follow you. And when your fruit follow you, you don't care what anybody calls you. A tree is known by its fruit it yields. And subsequently the seed it reproduces and multiplies. If I have an apple in my hand that I just plucked off of a tree, I don't have to think, well, is it a peach tree? And if I take the seeds of that apple that I just pulled off of that tree and I take the seeds and I replant it and it grows more apples and more trees, apple trees, then I know that the original was an apple. Do you follow what I'm saying? I know that sounds silly. But we're getting all mixed up with all these things. These signs, they pointed towards Jesus of Nazareth as the long-awaited Messiah, the coming one, the hope of Israel. This last line. Blessed is he who is not offended because of me. It took me a while, but I prayed, God, why did, why did Jesus say that? He says, go and tell John the things you have seen and heard. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them. Oh, and blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Why would you be offended? Who could be offended? Oh, but people were offended, weren't they? Many people were offended, weren't they? Why? Why were people offended? Why would Jesus say something like this? Because it did not happen the way we thought it would or the way it should. It didn't happen in our group. It didn't happen with our method. It didn't happen because of our efforts. So the Pharisees got upset, the Sadducees got upset, and everybody got upset. They were offended. It didn't happen the way they thought it should. It happened on a Sabbath. It happened to, to uh, uh, an old woman who had been uh, under a de uh, demons for 18 years. Because if God didn't uphold your methodology or your program or your doctrine, you get offended. Well, get over it. God does not owe you any vindication of your doctrine. People are praying for revival all the time and they don't really want revival. What they want you is to restore a, a, a greater exuberance of, and justification of my perpetuation of my teaching, my perpetuation of my methodologies. So we have our Bible schools and I say, God, I want revival. What do you really want? You don't want real, true revival. You don't want historic revival. What you want is you want God to stir up and make your meetings great so you can justify your perpetuation of your methodologies. That's what most people are praying for when they're asking for revival. They don't have the guts. They don't have the guts for true revival. All these things would produce an offense in the heart of the one who does not accurately see who Jesus of Nazareth is in the Father. If you don't really see who Jesus is, these things will offend you. Yeah, you go through them all day long. I, I tell you, I've had people all over the world get offended when people got healed because it didn't fit their doctrines. I've had Baptists get mad at me. I've had, I've had Lutherans get mad at me. I've had Pentecostals get mad at me because it didn't happen their way. Yeah, well, anyway. 